Hey, uh, welcome to the first video in the M5 Altium workshop series. Um, this is a set of videos that we're putting together to help SDP 21 students and probably even future SDP students um, get started with PCB design and use an Altium as it is a requirement for SDP. In previous years, we had this as a small group in-person workshop and it was, very, it was a very high level overview of just getting started with Altium and then more one-on-one -on -one work from there if you had questions. Um, but I think our goal this year is to build a series of videos that will last in the future and really give you that start to finish feel of a uh, PCB design. Um, so today is video one, it's just an introduction to PCBs. So I'm gonna hand it off to uh, Chris to take you through that. Awesome, so I'm gonna start off real quick just with the definition of a PCB. As you might know, PCB stands for printed circuit board. Um, you're going to have multiple layers of copper, and then they're going to be sandwiched to some insulating substrate. So probably most of the boards that we're going to see uh, in senior design project will be two layer boards. There's possibilities to make, you know, higher numbers of layers, uh, but two is typically sufficient for what we see in senior design projects. So right here, you can see I have two pictures on the left is just your average circuit board. I'm sure you've seen it before on the right. Uh, this is a cross section. This is a little bit interesting. This kind of gives you an idea of um, how the copper is sandwiched to the substrate. And also you can see here these, these holes that go through. Um, those are vias. So those are actually plated and they electrically connect the different layers of the board. Uh, so that's an important step that we're going to talk about later in manufacturing. So the first step in creating a PCB obviously is to design it. There's a couple of different softwares you can use to do that. We require Altium for senior design projects. So that is what all of our tutorial videos are going to focus on but you should probably be aware that there are other things like Eagle or KiCad. And when you use one of these softwares, you're typically going to see at least these two editors. So on the left, you can see there, I have the uh, schematic editor in Altium. And that is where you define what components you're going to be using and how you're going to electrically connect them. But it is not actually a physical representation of the board, right? This is just for the program to get an idea of, uh, you know, how things on your board need to be connected later on. So that on the right, when you actually plan out your physical board and you, you route these little traces to connect all the different pieces, the software can be aware that you're doing it correctly. So we're going to talk about these two editors uh, in the next couple of videos. So after you've designed a board, you need to actually send it uh, to a manufacturer. So the most common way to do that right now is the Gerber file format, which basically creates a different file for each layer of your board. And by layer, I don't mean physical layer necessarily. I mean, um, but we're about to talk about on the next slide, which I will jump into. Uh, there's multiple different layers uh, in the Gerber file format. So the top and bottom layers are going to be your electrical connections. They'll be the, the traces that actually connect the components, and that's what your signals will travel through. There's also a solder mask layer, which goes on top of those. That's an insulating, typically colored layer. Uh, so that's like the, the green color, basically, that gets put on top of the copper. And that's insulating, uh, and it helps against um, you know, corrosion on the board, and it also helps with soldering. Then there's the silk screen, which is actually just ink that's applied on top of the solder mask. So that will, you know, identify what parts you have there, um, you know, drawings, notes, things that you'll, you'll put on top of the board. Then there are mechanical layers, which are a little different. These are going to be non-electrical layers. So this is information relating to the uh, footprints of components and the clearances and the manufacturing steps. Um, there's a little bit of nuance to mechanical layers. They're worth reading about if you actually need to use them on your project. The keep out layer is, a, is another layer. Um, kind of how it sounds, it tells the program to uh, forbid uh, copper and components from being in a certain area so that you can meet very specific design constraints. You probably won't worry about those too much unless there's really a need to for your project. And then there's the drill guide, um, which is not technically a layer on its own, but it's basically a file that tells the manufacturer uh, kind of where they need to drill holes through your board for mounting screws, for pins, uh, and for vias. So speaking of milling, uh, most of your boards are probably going to be milled. And as you can see, there's a, there's a CNC right there with a tool head on it, and it's actually cutting through a blank uh, piece of copper. So that that actually is the entire um, substrate copper laminate that's being milled right now. And they, first they do one side and then they flip it over and line it up very precisely and then they cut the other side. And then they'll drill after that. So on the right here, you can see what that kind of looks like before it's got its solder mask on it. Um, you know, you can kind of 
see that what's left behind is these thin copper lines and underneath is the insulating substrate. A lot of PCBs are made through chemical etching as well, but we're probably going to assume that's not how your boards will be made because um, you know, typically you're not ordering a gigantic volume of PCBs for your specific design, so it's more likely that they'll just be milled. Correction. While holes and vias are drilled and board edges and cutouts are milled on a CNC, most fabricators will use chemical etching to create the traces on a circuit board. PCB mills do exist, but even the boards you design for SDP will likely be chemically etched. Really quick, uh, plating is a step that happens right after drilling is finished. This is how the vias get their uh, electrical conductivity. So you need to plate the entire board, um, especially the vias so that the inside of the holes are electrically conductive and they can actually um, carry current through different layers of the board. And then after vias have been uh, plated, then you got your solder mask. So like I mentioned, there's actually a bunch of different colors, um, but typically they have some color that you can choose. And it's, uh, it's really handy because when you go to solder your board, um, the solder mask will resist um, solder sticking to it, which means that if you have lots of pads close together, um, it'll be much easier to solder them without creating shorts between components. And like I said, it prevents the copper from oxidizing. You can also put the solder mask over the vias, which means that uh, you're less likely to accidentally stick solder to a via, which is great. Those are called tented vias, and we might uh, discuss them later in the series. And then I want to talk about silk screening. So silk screening is the process of actually applying that ink, like I mentioned. Uh, you can see a great picture here. This is a great use of silk screen. Obviously, it's kind of up to the designer to decide you know, what they want to put on the silk screen and, and how much silk screening they want to do on the board, but uh, it can be a really great opportunity to um, you know, make your board much more clear to the person assembling it or using it in the future. So that's a great example of how to use that. Right, so once you get the PCB from the manufacturing, then it's time for you to start assembling the PCB so you can do electronic stuff. There are a couple of ways to go about assembling your PCB with uh, different, pop, um, different parts. One of the most convenient easy to do one is hand soldering. Simply get a part on the PCB and start soldering with the soldering iron. This is one of the best ways, especially for prototyping. However, if you have more pins or something, some small parts that are difficult to solder with hand, you can go with hot air soldering. It uses um, hot air coming out from the hot air gun to melt the solder and fix the uh, soldering um, onto the board. Now, there are other footprints that we will show you in uh, very soon that you will, be, need to, you will need to use a reflow oven because there are solder underneath the part that you can't reach with soldering iron or hot air gun. For spreading, for reflow or even hot air or maybe even hand, hand soldering rarely, um, you will need to use something called soldering paste. Think of solder, but pastified, so it's like toothpaste, which once it's heated up, it becomes a solder, a solid solder. To spread it more efficiently on your PCB, you can get something called stencil from the PCB manufacturer, which will cost a little more money, but if you have a lot of SMD components that you need to solder, and you will you, you you know for sure you're going to be using reflow oven for instance this will be a good choice now you can see a couple of different methods of mounting a component through hole is one of the most familiar uh, um, to people who have it worked with kits before connector is sort of like a combination of these two with the through hole part being mechanical support and of course there's smt and bga the smt so I components are very small. You can see in the picture below. Sometimes they are way too small to solder by, by hand. And for BGA soldering, you have to be careful because there are many, many tiny balls making electrical connection. If you shift them by a little bit, you could end up with wrong connectors. So now I'm going to take you through a couple of the more common footprints that you're going to come across during uh, your adventure into PCB design. There's 
so many different footprints. I mean, uh, even just changing the pins, like removing a pin on a part technically makes it a, new, a different footprint. But the common ones you're gonna see are dual inline package or dip. Um, this is, you know, something that you'd see a part that, on a part that you use in a breadboard. Uh, it has the leads that you can snap down into a breadboard. Um, on a PCB, this would be something where there'll be um, the through hole soldering, where there's holes in the PCB itself and you solder it through on the bottom side. The next is the SO whatever. There's all kinds of different series of that. There's uh, SOT, SOIC. Um, it's just small outline. They're usually pretty small components, but still manageable to solder by hand. Then you get into the thin quad flat package family. This is where you might want to start considering some hot air or reflow oven. Sometimes they'll have pads on the bottom side that you need to use a hot air gun for. Um, but if the chip is a decent size, you can still get away with hand solder and some of the uh, pins on its sides. And then you have BGA or ball grid array. Um, this is impossible to solder by hand as every single um, uh, contact point is on the underside of the chip. Um, you should be aware that other components like electrolytic capacitors, tantalum capacitors, they have their own sizing convention. Um, and this kind of just goes along with, there's tons and tons of different components you're gonna run into. For resistors and, and uh, non-polarized capacitors, you have the just general metric or imperial units that they're measured in uh, that you saw the picture of on the previous slide. And what we have here is just a couple examples of different um, footprints and packages. The top left picture is a couple of different SO um, packages. You can see some SOTs on the bottom left of that picture, some just bigger packages as you go up. Um, another one in the middle is an SOP8 right there. And then top right is a dip package. We suggest that if you're gonna use a dip package in your PCB, um, to use a socket below it. The socket is in the picture right below it there. Um, essentially what it'll allow you to do is solder the socket onto your PCB and then interchange the dip package whenever you need to program it or um, replace the chip. Bottom left here, you can see we have a BGA, the ball grid array. It's just speckled with pins all over its bottom side. And then the last two pictures are two different, um, the uh, quad side thin package, flat package. Um, you see the one, the one in the bottom middle, that would be something you would probably need the hot air gun to solder, whereas you, could, you might be able to get away if you're skilled enough to solder the bottom right by hand. Now I just wanna go over a couple um, keywords that we haven't mentioned yet, but you should know moving forward. Um, in particular, copper weight. Copper weight is a measurement of the thickness of the copper foil on your PCB. It's defined as weight per square foot, which is why it's called copper weight. But in reality, what it is is the thickness of your copper. This comes into play when you're choosing trace widths, depending on your voltage and current through a, a trace. Um, but more on that later. Routing. Uh, with the talk of CNC machines and milling PCBs, um, we don't want you to get confused with routing a board as that. When we talk about routing, we mean the actual lay-in of copper traces as you want to define them on your PCB. Another one is the mill, M-I-L. It's an imperial unit used in PCB design. It is not a millimeter. It is one one thousandth of an inch. Altium does a really good job of interchanging between the two if you have to. Um, but again, more on that later when we get to Altium. And then I just want to mention rules as well. It's a list of constraints that you're going to define in Altium based on your manufacturer's constraints. Um, basically, what it allows you to do is Altium will make sure your PCB, when you're making it, um, meets the constraints of the manufacturer. You don't have to do all the checks yourself. You define them once, and every change you make, Altium makes sure it's a legal change. And we're just going to wrap it up today with a couple different Altium file formats that you're going to come across in the coming videos, just to give you an idea. So you have your schematic, which as Chris mentioned before, is kind of the definition of electrical connections and components you're using. And then you have your PCB, which represents the actual physical layout of a board and how you're gonna, how you're gonna lay out the copper traces. We have uh, two other ones here, the schematic library. Uh, schematic library for a project is a grouping of all your custom schematic symbols and pin definitions for any custom symbol you have to make. Then you have a PCB library, which goes hand in hand with the schematic library. It's a 
grouping of the footprints and mechanical information for the parts you're going to be using. The symbol doesn't necessarily have to be physically accurate, whereas a PCB footprint does. And you are, and then you're able to connect your schematic library and PCB library uh, together for a, a part, and then you have a completed component that can be used in your design. You have your built your bomb, your bill of materials. It just an exported list from Altium that tells you all the parts you need for your design, how many of each. And then we have your output job files. Um, this is the Gerber files we talked about earlier. It's just a folder. It contains all of you know your Gerber files, drill files, any PDFs that you have um, that you'll then send off to the manufacturer. Um, join us next time. We're going to head into Altium, get started with the schematic editor, and um, good luck in your PCB design.